good morning, faith family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Children's Church is headed that way. You'd like to go? Amen. You had Bibles like to read one. Let's go to Luke's Gospel, chapter ten. Luke's Gospel, chapter ten. Get all this, all these lights, and all over the one big ball, and all over the don't work, and I don't understand 
why they don't work. All they did is just sit in a dark place since 12 months ago. I don't understand why they don't work when you get them out and you scream them out. And half of them don't work when you go find more Christmas lights. It's just so busy. And then you begin to think about that. And after Thanksgiving, what do we have? Black Friday. Black Friday comes along, and then we, we got Black Friday shopping, and everybody's hustling and bustling, and then you got to try to figure out what to buy for the hard ones on your list, the people that just got everything, right? And then you try to, you figure it out, and you go, you're at their house, you say, oh, they need one of these, or you hear them say something, yeah, I would really like to have one of these, next time you go to their house, you, you come up with this great idea that you're going to get them for Christmas, and lo and behold, they've got one. They went and bought one. So as you begin to think about all of this stuff, and then you go back and exchange gifts, and, and all of this, and then Christmas dinner, trying to fix the right thing, trying to accommodate everybody, because everybody don't like the same thing. So as we see all of this, we begin to think about how stressful it is, and how hard it is, and, and you can begin to think, imagine this story, if we're just having a complicated time having our family in our home, can we imagine what it was like for Martha and Mary to have Jesus in their home. You know, people in Mark, well, this reminds me of a story I heard one time about a guy that was kind of overwhelmed with, his, with, with the stresses of life. And he hired this guy. I didn't know there was such a thing, but he hired this guy. He is a professional worrier. And he hired him to, to worry about his problems. I need to. That, that pro Donald in the back, he's a professional worker. <laughs> I didn't know there was such a thing. <laughs> but he's like, we have one in the house. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so as you think about that, he began to worry about all of this guy's problems, take care of all of his affairs. And he got all of his business in order. And about a year later, he'd come back to him and he said, look here. He said, I've got everything taken care of for you. There's nothing left for you to worry about. He said, I'm taking care of all your finances. I'm taking care of all your affairs to the point that you can just, you can just live life for a while. You don't have to worry about anything. He said, well, there's one thing. He said, how am I going to get paid? He said, I need somebody to pay me. How are you going to pay me? He said, I'm going to let you worry about that. <laughs> so that's kind, of, that's kind of how we are. We need somebody to help us along and along. But I think a lot of us, the worry and the anxiety that we bring as we're going to look into this message in just a moment, I think so much, a lot of it's self-inflicted. A lot of it is something that, that we have chosen to do that we brought upon ourselves to cause this worry. And, and I think we can sort through this. But here's the most important thing I want to really get from this message today. If we don't get anything else, let's just understand as we embark upon this holiday season, we embark upon Christmas, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year is when Mark, let's don't miss Jesus. And I, I know that we're early for Christmas messages, but I think we need to really be thinking about this and preparing ourselves, not only for Christmas, but I think we need to be preparing ourselves for the remainder of the year. You know, we all make New Year's resolutions, but I think we need to make sure that we put our priorities in order, that we really get to a place that we don't miss Jesus in the midst of all this. So let's begin to read it as we pick up this story here in, uh, in verse 38. It said that it came to pass when they, <clears throat> as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Now, as we begin to understand this, this is Martha and Mary. These are the two sisters of Lazarus. And we remember the story of Lazarus and Lazarus had been dead for four days and Jesus showed up. This was his sister. Now, as we understand this, they were friends with Jesus. They were friends with they were friends of the family, or he was friends of the family, <coughs> and he would go there to their house, and he would frequent their house. And every time that they did, or he did, she would prepare, or Martha would prepare, Martha and Mary would prepare this meal for him, and they would go out, and they would, they would just show their hospitality, and they would really get to invite him in, and, and it became a oh, big deal. So this was, no, this was like no other time, or any other time. They began to come in, or he began to come to their house, and they began to feast him. They begin to celebrate his, uh, his appearance there. And I think as we begin to understand this, you can only imagine having Jesus in her house exactly what Martha was thinking. Now Martha will find out in the word. She's anxious about everything. Everything had to be just right. Some people worry about that a lot more than others. I'm not one of them people. If it's right, if it's right everything's perfect, that's good. If everything's not perfect, that's okay with Mark. But as you begin to see, there's a lot of people that are real anxious and it has to be, it has to be just right. And I think Martha was one of those, or uh, Martha was one of those people. And it was a day to create a special uh, memory, and it turned into a day of worry and anxiety. 
It just turned, it took a turn for the worse. Uh, she's slicing and dicing, cooking and cleaning. She's trying to get everything in order. She's consumed by what she's doing. Not only is she consumed by what she's doing, she's just overwhelmed uh, and anxious about what she still has to do. So here she is. She's not only, she's just kind of got the cumbersome load of everything upon her, but now her mind just can't rest because it's, it's, she's worried about what's going to happen, worried about what's going to be left out, worried about what she's not going to get done. Now, I can preach this message to me because sometimes I do that. I, they don't have to all be perfect, but sometimes I do get overwhelmed by things that, that, that I feel like I'm, I'm not going to be able to get to. Sometimes when you just can't see that light at the end of the tunnel, sometimes when you just don't know, sometimes when everything just seems like it piles up and there's not enough hours in the day, anybody been there besides me, it gets, it gets overwhelming sometimes. And sometimes I think that, that we, that's the, you know the old song, One Day at a Time? There's a whole lot of truth in that, and that's exactly what we have to do. We have to prioritize and take it one day at a time. We have to but we have to come to a place in our life where we realize and prioritize that some things are just really important. Some things we think we need to do are not really important at all. And as we begin to see this, we begin to see that, that she is consumed. And here comes her array of emotions as we begin to read in verse 40 or 39. And she had a sister called Mary, which also <coughs> sat at the feet of Jesus and heard his word. But Martha was coming about my serving and came to him. And she said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister had left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Now you see this array of emotions. Ah, right, here she is. She's slicing, dicing, getting everything ready. She's looked around, and all of a sudden, her sister's gone. All of a sudden, she, she's missing her. Maybe she needed to ask her for something. Maybe she needed her to help her do this or whatever. She looks around and Mary is gone. And then she kind of peeks through the living room. Peeks into the living room and there's Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Here she is. She's resting in recline while Mark was left to cook and clean and take care of all the, the work and prepare the meal. And as we begin to look at this, this array of emotions just begin to, to pour out. She feels alone. She feels abandoned. And eventually, all of that <clears throat> desperation turns to what? Anger. She's mad. We find that as we get into verse 41. We read that again, but it says this. It says, or verse 40, I'm sorry. But Martha was covered about my serving and came to him and said, Lord, Dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Can you almost hear the anger in her voice? <laughs> now you think about this for just a moment. Here she is. She's realized that she's alone. She realized that Mary's left her. And she kind of peeks into that living room. And there she is. Along with Jesus and his disciples and guests and people that's in there. And all of a sudden she steps to the door. And I can just see her feeling. And she, she looks at Jesus and she says, Jesus, do you not care that my sister has left me alone in here to cook and clean and call and work? Do, do, do you not care? And all of a sudden here I can just see everybody in the room looking at each other, waiting to see what's going to happen next. And probably they're looking at each other whispering, awkward. This is fixing to get awkward. And as we see this, we begin to see that she's angry, she's upset, she's to the point that it's a question, but it's almost an accusation. It's almost an accusation to the point that you not care, bid her, tell her to get up and get in here and help me in this kitchen. And I think as we begin to, to see this, we begin to see her, her words are, are very relevant from the abundance of the heart. The Bible says the mouth speaks. That's where we're at. That's where she's at. Her heart has come to a place that she's angry, she's bitter, she's upset. And, and if we're not careful, if we're not really careful, sometimes this will happen to us. We feel if we're the only one doing anything. We feel sometimes that we're unappreciated. We feel like that, that you, you know we're not getting recognition for what we do. And I think this is where she was at. I think she was to the point that she had loaded her schedule trying to, to make it all about her and what she could do and how she could help Jesus and how she could serve Jesus and what she could do in that capacity. But I think it had overwhelmed her to the point that she felt like that, that no one was helping her, but it was her choice to do this. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But I think as you begin 
begin to, to look at this, we begin to see what happens in, when this happens to us. In order to understand that, let's go to, you don't have to turn there, I'm going I'm to read it to you, but 1 Kings chapter 19, I want to read something really quick there as we uh, think about this. When we think about, could it happen to a Christian? Could it happen to a man or a woman of God? Most certainly. Most certainly because we have an adversary. We have an enemy. We have someone that tries to tear down what God is doing in our life. And this is how he does it sometimes. But we'll get to this in just a moment. But I want to think about Elijah for just a moment. If you remember the story of Elijah on the top of Mount Carmel when he had went up there in the prophets of Baal. Now all of a sudden he had called down fire and this was a time of revival. This was a time when everybody had stepped up and they been beginning to declare, the Lord, He is God, the Lord, He is God. And now as we get to understand this, word had got back to the king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel, that uh, what Elijah had done, that he had tore down the grove, that he had, he had turned the people back to the true and living God. And all of a sudden they rose against him, and all of a sudden here we find him hiding in the cave, we find him at a point in his life, and that he is, he is he feels like that, that he's unappreciated. He feels like that no one cares. He feels like he's the only one. And as we read this in, in uh, verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 1, it said, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and said, Let the gods do to me and more. Also, if I make thy life, is that the life of them by tomorrow about this time? And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and he came to Beersheba with the law to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life away from me, for I am no better than my father. And as he slept under the juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him, and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake of bear, a cake of bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water in his head. And he did eat and drink, and he laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came to him a second time, touched him, and said, Arise, eat and drink, for the journey is too great for thee. He arose, he did eat and drink, he went in the strength of the meat for forty days and forty nights of the horrible mountain God. And he came down into a cave, and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very, we'll get this part right here, verse 10, he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy daughters, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek to take my life away. Do you see that? Do you notice something particular about that? Notice one thing how many times he uses the word I in there. It's all about him. He's looking at a place in his life where he feels like he's the only one. He feels like he is the, the one that's done it all. He feels like he is the, the person that's been neglected. And here he is. He's to a point. He said, I'm ready to just throw in the towel. I'm ready to give up the fight. I'm ready to just quit. He said, take my life away from me. I'm no better than anybody else. Do you see his discouragement? Do you see his despair? And so many times that's how it works in our life and we're not careful. We'll get so caught up in what we're doing. Do we miss what God's doing? And God told him, get up. i got a lot of work for you to do. But so many times, we get hindered. And who hinders us? It's not God. It's not us. It's the enemy himself tries to hinder us in our work. Now understand this. God just did a great work through Elijah on the top of the mountain. And God's got a greater work that he wants to do through him. And Satan realized that, and all of a sudden he came and he put that seed of doubt. He came and he put that seed of discouragement and despair. And, 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 and he felt like he was abandoned there in the cave <laughs> that nobody cared. And God came to him and encouraged him. And he sent an angel to bring uh, a cake of bread and, and water to his side. And as we understand this, we begin to see that if it happened to Elijah, no doubt it can happen to us. But you know, as you begin to think about well, how he did this, notice what he did in Elijah's life, notice what he did in, in Martha's life, or Mary, Martha's life. Is we, we begin to see that it can happen to us. He didn't take Martha out of the kitchen. He didn't take her out and say, Martha, you just go sit down, it's going to be all right. This is how Satan works. He, he didn't just try to convince her to quit, but he took away her purpose in the kitchen. 
And her purpose was to honor God, and to honor with Him with, with a meal, but it was to honor Jesus. Now think about this for just a moment. Let's understand how he worked. He began to take away her purpose. What's the reason that she was doing this? He turned that against her. And it's, it's not that he won't turn you against the church. He'll turn you, he'll turn you towards yourself in the church and what we're doing in the church. And this is kind of how he worked. And it gets to the point, it's all about me, it's all about my feelings, it's all about how I feel. And all of a sudden, when we begin to feel that way, the trap snaps up. And then we begin to understand that oh my, we're in a position of woe is me. And I think as we begin to understand this, we begin to see what he's doing. He won't take you from your ministry, but he'll disillusion you in your ministry to the point that, that you lose focus on him, on Jesus. You lose focus on him and put the focus on something else. And that's exactly what had happened. All the focus that Martha had was on what she needed to do and what had not been done and who was not doing their part and who all was there and how she was going to overcome all this stuff instead of just focusing on Jesus. Now, as you begin to understand this, Martha wanted it to be all about white linen tablecloth and she wanted to cook the fatty calf or whatever she was cooking. I'm sure she went all in. But, it, you know, Jesus was the... To, to be able to come and, and sit down and enjoy fellowship with him, he could have had a peanut butter jelly sandwich and probably been happy and she would have been able to engage in some worship with him. You see what she's all about now. She's got to the point that she has overwhelmed herself. She's chosen to do this and now she's got she's got bottled up to the point that she can't get out of it and now her sister has went and done the one thing we'll talk about in just a moment. But she become more... <clears throat> concerned about the lack of what she had more than the pleasing God, her time pleasing God. So if we're not careful, Satan will do that. He'll, he'll convince us. And I want you to notice the, to the point what he said or she said here in verse 40. As we look at that, it said, But Martha was comforted about my serving and came to him. And notice what she said. She said, Lord, dost thou not care? You know, so many times we'll get busy in our own doing. We'll get busy serving to the point that we think that we're serving the Lord and it becomes about us and we, it begins, we don't prioritize and we don't spend that time giving instructions from God. And all of a sudden, when we get overwhelmed, when we get overwhelmed in and of our own doing sometimes, then we get agitated and we pray and we look up at God and we say, God, don't you care? Don't you care? That's where she's at. She's at a point that she says, Lord, don't you care? She has, he has, she has been driven to a point that she says, God don't even care anymore. We know that that's a lie of the devil. We know that that's a lie of the enemy. We know that he does care. He loves us so much. We know that he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. But we begin to feel that in our heart that God don't even care anymore. And I think as we begin to understand this, and he begins to put this stuff in there. You're the only one working. No one's helping you. It's not fair. You've been done wrong. Everything, everybody's against you. Nobody cares. God don't even care. And here we are. We see this. It comes to a, to a, a point in our life where it was stress comes when we think we, we've got to do it all. And I think a lot of people will tell you that. When we try to do it all, that's when the stress comes. I don't believe that's necessarily when the stress comes. I believe the stress is when we try to do it without God. That's when the stress comes. God will enable us to do a lot of things. And God can do great and mighty things through us. But when we get to the point where we leave Him out of it, when we get to the point where it's about us and it's not about Him anymore, I don't care what ministry you in. If it's not, if God's not in the center of that ministry, if God's not in the midst of that ministry to the point that we're seeking His face every day and saying, God, where do I need to go in this ministry? How do I need to serve you? What do I need to do next? Well, how do I need to, to take care of it? If we're not seeking His face every day in that ministry, you know what? It will become more about us than it becomes about God. And all of a sudden, what happens? We become stressed. We become overwhelmed. And then we get to a point where we, we get all this bogged up on top of us. And then we pray. And we try to get it out. And we say it at the last minute. But here we, we, we try to do it all on our own. And we, didn't, we failed and we failed miserably. And then all of a sudden, we look at God and say, well, God, don't you care? Amen. And God's looking at us like, why? Why are you asking me that? Why don't you just decided to come to me? And I think 
so many times if we're not careful, that's what will happen. It'll become about us, and it'll become about what we want and our desire, and we'll fail to ask God. But you know, as we begin to think about that, she opened her home to him in verse 38. We see that she invited Jesus. Jesus didn't ask for a big meal. Her anxiety is the product, product of her choices. She chose to do this. And I think as you begin to kind of change this and shift this passage of Scripture just a little bit into verse 42, we see that there's another sister. We see that there's a sister named Mary in verse 42. And it says, in the last part of verse 41, Jesus speaks to her and says, Martha, Martha, thou art not careful, and thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary hath chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now, as we begin to think about this here, she was in there, she was working, and she was busy, and, and, and now we find her in there sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Martha's upset about this. Martha's to the point that she says, hey, I'm, I, I'm, just, I'm just mad. And, you know, <clears throat> as we begin to think about the one thing, that one thing that Jesus said, he said, well, what is that one thing? One thing is mentioned several times in the Bible. It's mentioned throughout Scripture. I'll, I'll screenshot it when I go to my phone where I can read it to you really quick so you don't have to turn there. But as we begin to think about one thing and what that's all about, we begin to think about some of the Scripture that Jesus has left us with. Uh, Psalm 27, it talks about one thing. One thing I desire of the Lord that, he will, that I will see that I may dwell in His house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in His temple. You know, as we begin to think about one thing, this is the prophet writing, the psalmist writing. As he's writing, he said, one thing I desire. I desire to be in the presence of God. I desire to be in the will of God. I desire to be in His purpose, what His purpose is for my life. And then you Talk, go back to Luke's Gospel chapter 18, the rich young ruler. When Jesus met with him, when Jesus heard the things that he said, Jesus said, You still lack one thing. Amen. Sell everything you got and come and follow me. And if we remember that story, we remember that that rich young ruler had great possessions. And as we begin to understand, he went away sorrowful because he would not get rid of the one thing that was holding him from following Jesus, that was keeping him from following Jesus. We remember that story and you say, well, we, we can't have possessions, we can't have things. Yes, we can have possessions and things as long as we don't put them ahead of Jesus. And that's what he was doing. Jesus looked into his heart and he knew that those possessions were keeping him from being what God wanted him to be. And he said, this one thing this one thing is holding you back. I think about that again. I think about as we leave talking about the Apostle Paul. And he said this. He said, Brethren, this is in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind me. And I reach ahead to those which are ahead of me. Now, if we begin to understand this, we begin to see these one things that they're talking about. What are they doing? What are, what are they doing? They're making a lasting implication in the kingdom. They're making a lasting mark in the kingdom of God. And as we begin to understand this, so how do we know if we're doing the right thing? How do we know if we're serving right in the ministry? And I think we've got to ask the question, how do we understand that? Is it lasting? Is what we are doing, is it making a lasting mark in the kingdom? Because so many times we do a lot of things whether it's in ministry or whether it's just in day-to-day -day routine, we do a lot of things that don't add anything to the kingdom of God. And sometimes I think this is where we got to prioritize. A lot of times this is where we got to prioritize. And I think when we begin to, to create an agenda, and we begin to pray and we begin to seek God, we've got to ask the question, is this going to be, is this going to advance the kingdom of God or is this just something I'm doing? And I think when we begin to answer those questions honestly and earnestly in our heart, I believe we'll find ourselves, we'll find ourselves in the, in the will and the purpose of God, and we'll stay intact in our ministry, we'll stay on, on point in our ministry, we'll stay where God would have us in our ministry. And I think, you know, this all started in the kingdom, or in the kitchen. Now, now think about this for just a moment. We got to look at where these two ladies were at. Both of them started out the same. Now I think that we got to ask the question, 
Was it essential or was it eternal? When we see these ladies, they saw something. Martha saw something that was essential to be able to accomplish the task that was before her. It was essential that she provided a big meal for Jesus. It was essential. But was it going to change eternity? Absolutely not. Did it matter if she had leg of lamb or peanut butter and jelly? Absolutely not. So I think as you begin to see this, and we begin to understand this, this was essential what? It was essential for Martha to be recognized. It was essential for her to be, to people to look at her and say, look what Martha did. For Jesus to say, thank you Martha for this great meal that you prepared. Hey guys, look, look what Martha's done for me. And stand up and give her a round of applause. As we look at that, that's what she was looking for. She was looking for someone to applaud her. She was looking for someone to say, hey, Martha, you did an awesome job. Now, now understand, it is good to, to you know, come in and tell people and thank people for what they've done. But we've got to understand, it's not about us all the time. Just because we have a ministry, I'm not looking for somebody to stand up and applaud me because I, I, I get up and I preach. I'm certainly not looking for that at all. I, I'm telling you very quickly, if you tell me that you enjoyed my sermon or, or I did a great job, and I, and I appreciate those comments, don't get me wrong, but I'll be the first one to tell you, you, you you'll hear me say it going out the door, if there's any praise, it goes to God. Give the Lord the praise. It has nothing to do with me because I can't do this. So as we see that and understand that, we've got to realize that Martha's looking for something because she's looking for attention to be brought to her. Now I think as we kind of understand this, it's starting in the kitchen, and here, here she realized that, or Mary did, Mary's over here, she's right along with Martha, she's peeling potatoes, and washing and cleaning and doing all this, and all of a sudden she realized something. You know what she realized? She realized how hard she was working and how hard she was talking. And all of a sudden, she looked in there and she saw Jesus in the living room. And she the thought crossed her mind. Here I am. I'm in here working and toiling. I'm in here peeling potatoes. And Jesus is in the house. You know what? I'm going to lay my peeler down. And I'm going to go in here and I'm going to get in the presence of Jesus. I want to sit in the presence of Jesus. And I think so many times that when we come to church, this is where we're at. We come to church and we can't clear our minds of the week ahead of us or the day ahead of us or what's going on in our life and the troubles and the strife and the anxiety and being overwhelmed and, and all this stuff. We can't clear our mind long enough to just come and sit and laugh in the presence of Jesus Christ. We begin to understand that so many, and I, I don't think I can, I know I don't ask anybody to raise your hand, but I, I'm not here to embarrass anybody, but I dare say in the house right now, there's somebody that has just been thinking until I said this, you've just been thinking, man, what about, look at all the stuff i got to do this week. Amen. Look at all the stuff that I've got to accomplish. i got this to do and that to do. Why do we come to church? We come to church to glorify God. We come to church to, to adore Him and to worship Him. And as we think about that, that's a tactic of the enemy to get our mind boggled up to the point that we can't really just sit. Just sit in the presence of God. And all of a sudden Mary realized that. She said, why am I peeling potatoes when Jesus is in the house? Why am I over here working my fingers to the bone when I could be sitting in the presence of the Son of God? And I think as we begin to see that it started in the kitchen and she realized that. And you know what she did? She put down her potato paper. She went and sit with Jesus. Amen. And I think as we understand that, we begin to realize that that's exactly what we're going to have to do in our ministry. That's what we're going to have to do in life. Sometimes we just need to put down the potato paper and come sit in front of Jesus. Yeah. And allow Him to speak to our heart. Allow Him to encourage us. Allow Him. You know what Jesus said to her? To Martha? He said, Martha, Martha. Martha, He said, you're really anxious and you're really cumbered by all the things that's going on. He said, but Mary has chosen a different route. Mary has chosen the right way. Mary has chosen the right things. And, and I think as we begin to understand that, we see where the enemy is trying to pull us to. And, and I hope and pray that, that through this holiday season, if y'all want to come and give a song, we can take it down and go. Uh, <clears throat> through this holiday season, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And you know, we don't even say that. Whoo, i got so much to do. If you give me to the first of the year, I'll get started. 
I'm going to start. We make these resolutions year after year after year. And I think as we understand that, so many times, this is a twofold message. I think it affects those of us that are in ministry and those of us that are just going through life that may not have a specific ministry that we're, that we're working in. But I think that Jesus is giving us a ministry and the enemy wants to take Jesus out of that ministry. And if, Jesus, if the enemy can take Jesus out of that ministry, then what are we left with? Us. We have a ministry that's all about us. And you know where a ministry that's all about us is going? Nowhere. I think as we begin to think about that, we begin to see where the enemy tries to disillusion us and get us to the point that we believe that we're working so hard and all of a sudden we get upset, we get, we get our feelings hurt, we get angry, we get to the point that it's a ray of emotions just begin to fester up inside of us and blow out and all of a sudden she's mad with her sister and it causes us to have hard feelings toward different people. And, and, and I think as we see this, we see that what happened, the enemy took Jesus out of that kitchen. He took Jesus out of her purpose in that kitchen. And it was no longer about Jesus. It was all about her. And I think so many times we get to that point, but here's the thing. It makes no difference if we're in a ministry, or it makes no difference if you're, if you're lost and undone in the world. That enemy will try those same tactics. He'll use those same tactics to disillusion and distract you. If you're here and you're in a ministry, maybe you just need some time to feed Jesus this morning. Maybe you're overwhelmed with what's going on and you're serving and you're working and all of a sudden it's just got more than, bigger than you can handle. Don't get to the point that you allow the enemy to take Jesus out of your ministry. Don't get to the point that you are so weary and well doing that you can't focus on the ministry and what God will have you to do in that ministry. There's a time and there's a place that we just have to steal away as Mary did and we have to find ourselves at the feet of Jesus. And we have to ask Him to be real and say, God, I need you to be real in my life. And I need you to help me to understand what you want me to do, the direction you need me to go. Because I don't want it to be all about me. God, it's got to be all about you. It's got to be all about you, God. Because in order for it to work, it has to be about you. And as we begin to think about that so many times, but before we ever say, I can remember times in my life when, when I was felt like I needed Jesus Christ in my life, but I was still going and living the life of the world. And all of a sudden, Jesus was speaking to my heart and, and He would tell me, He wants you to go to church and I want, to, I want to love you and I want to take care of you and I want you to, I want to forgive you all the wrongs that you've ever done. But then all of a sudden, that enemy would come and he said, that, he said, that all sounds good, but there's no way you've done too much. God can't love you through all this you've done. But you see the delusion that he puts there. You see what he tries to do. Is he tries to get between you and God and put enmity there. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. When we talked or last week, I believe it was. When we talked about Adam and Eve in the garden. What he did, he put enmity between God and man. And as we're here this morning, if you're struggling with something, and you're struggling, and maybe you just feel like God wants to love on you this morning, and he, He's touched your heart with the Spirit, and we will give this invitation in just a moment. And don't you think for a, a moment that Satan won't show up in the middle of that invitation, and He'll tell you that surely God don't love you that much. Surely He, he, won't, he can't save you. Surely He can't forgive you for all that you've done. Don't think He won't do that, but you've got to disregard that this morning and come to the place in your life where you realize that greater is He that's in the house this morning than all the people that's in the world and all the demons that, that may come and, and try to tear down what God's building up. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what, what the enemy has placed in your mind, but God loves you this morning. He loves you this morning. And if you're here, whether you're in a ministry, but whether you just need to come and just sit at His feet this morning. I pray God will give you the courage to do that. I pray He'll just fill your heart this morning with the love, the mercy, and the grace that He so graciously extends to us. And I pray that if you're here and your ministry's just struggling, you feel like you're overwhelmed, you feel like quitting. Church, I've been there. I've been there. But here's the good thing about it. It don't matter when we, it don't matter how we, we, weary we get, just a little time, just a little time in His feet will change that. A little time in His presence will encourage us. 
a little time in His presence will move mountains out of our way. It'll take that. It'll take that anxiety. It'll take that fear. And it'll take that the, the overwhelmness out of our lives. And it'll help us to be able to stay focused and get focused. Because so, so many times we get weary and we're in the valley and we can't see out. But God will lift us up to the point. I think so many times we're, 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 we're falling down and, and, and we're just wallowing in the mud and we say, God, there's no way out. But all of a sudden, Jesus comes by and lifts us up to the point that we can see above. See above what's going on in our life. And look for that end, that, 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 that purpose and that plan that He has for our life. I don't know where you're at this morning. If you're here, you need to just come and sit in the, in the presence of Jesus for a little bit. Just come and spend some time with Him. What a wonderful day. Whether you're lost or saved, in ministry or just a, just come this morning to be able to see Jesus Christ. I pray that God will move in your heart this morning. And he will give you that as you stand in need. And let us pray and believe together. Father God, we thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you so much for your son Jesus. That while we were yet sinners, you came and demonstrated on the cross at Calvary how much he loved us. By giving us life, that we can have life and life more abundantly through the very plan of salvation that you created in Him. And God, I pray this morning that you just begin to help us through this season, not only through this holiday season, but God, this season of life that we're in. God, that we might be able to just take a little time and sit at your feet. That we may be able to forget about ourselves and come into your house and just praise you this morning. We might be able to leave self at the door. We might be able to just leave all of our, our troubles and trials. And, and, and God, if we need to come and lay them in the, in the feet of Jesus this morning, then I pray you'll give folks courage and boldness to be able to do that. Give them that desire to come and just look to you and trust in you. And I pray that you'll just minister to them as only you can. And God, if there's one here that don't know you, the free part of forgiveness of sin, Lord, I pray that you'll just touch them. I pray that you'll just let them see how much you love them this morning. God, don't let the enemy win this morning. I pray that you'll be victorious in this house today. And I pray that you'll draw them one. If there's one, two, or ten that don't know you, I pray that you'll draw them out of the miry clay and set their feet on the solid rock foundation of Jesus Christ this morning. I pray, God, that you would just have your will in your way that we might be able to see and know that God is in us. And all things work together for good for those that love Him and those that are called according to His purpose. God, we give you liberty in this service today to do your perfect work. We love you, we thank you, we praise you. We ask all of these favors and blessings in Jesus' precious and holy name we do pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.